Okay, hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for the REXIS 2020 session on real, real world applications. So this is the first paper session in this, of this conference. And my name is Zeno Gantner and I'm your chair for this session. And just a little housekeeping before we started. If you have any questions for a particular presentation, please hop onto the Hoover agenda entry for the presentation. If you're on the desktop app, the live video streaming will be playing on a floating window so you don't miss anything. And we have a quite tight schedule uh, here. So I encourage you to follow up with speakers and continue the discussion after the session on Hoover if uh, your question does not get answers. And without further ado, let's get started. Our first uh, speaker is Banu Prakash Rediguda. And there will be a presentation on goal-driven command recommendations for analysts. Thank you. Uh, shall I start? Yes, please start. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Banu Prakash uh, from Adobe Research, and I'll be talking about uh, goal-driven command recommendations for uh, analysts. Uh, with the volume of data increasing day by day, uh, the capabilities to support uh, processing of this data have advanced. And uh, the analyst whose task is to analyze uh, this data uh, needs to make several actions and decisions within the software application to achieve their goals. Uh, considering the volume of data to be analyzed, uh, there is a demand for systems to query, analyze, and draw inferences with a very low latency. Uh, now, this demand carries over to users assigned to the task of analyzing the data. This brings us to the question, uh, how do we guide the analysts with their workflows uh, based on their goals? Uh, as one can understand, uh, this question itself is a wide area of interest, and we try to solve it uh, to some extent using the next step recommendation model. Uh, our solution is to provide a recommender system uh, for this problem. Uh, a recommender system can act as a primary filter to uh, rule out those options that are completely irrelevant. Um, the model that is learned from those users who are familiar and have been performing tasks on the application uh, can guide as an act as uh, can uh, act as a guide for the novice user. Uh, our objectives for such a recommender system are uh, improve the performance of the recommender system, of course. Um, and uh, the recommendation should be relevant to the analyst uh, goal or task. And we should be able to share the recommendations uh, whenever the analyst is uh, deviating from the goal uh, or task that uh, the analyst has specified. Uh, let's have a look at some of the prior art in this area. Uh, there is a vast amount of literature uh, of, uh, related to the concept of goals in process mining, web mining, education, and HPI. Uh, one of the early works, the Lumia project uh, from Microsoft, defines a goal as a set of target tasks or subtasks at the focus of user's attention. Um, here are a couple of recent works which are closest to our approach. Uh, the first one is unraveling uh, and learning workflow models from interleaved event logs. Uh, in this work, they have used probabilistic topic trees to model workflows, and uh, they have used topic modeling to identify the tasks or workflows. The second work is a previous work from us. Uh, we have proposed a neural network architecture whose objective is to predict uh, the next command in a sequence, uh, in a sequence of a session uh, that is aligned with the task of that session. Uh, we different these prior works by making the recommendations more goal-oriented uh, with explicit signals through inputs and also loss functions. Uh, here is an overall workflow of our approach. Uh, this is the workspace that is available to the analyst. Um, here is an extension that we have built using our model. Now the user chooses uh, his or her goal for a session. Uh, after choosing uh, the goal, as soon as the user starts performing the actions, uh, they get their uh, insights along with uh, we, start, uh, we start providing the recommendations to the, uh, to the user. Uh, here is the uh, picture of the entire backend components together. Uh, but before going through each of these components, let's have a look at the data set. Uh, the application which we consider for this work is a web analytics system. Uh, the recommendations we are going to provide are the options that are present in the software. So the data set uh, we deal is the user interface clicks. Um, 
we categorize the user interface clicks into um, uh, two categories one is the software commands and one is the data commands so these examples from the spreadsheet application provides the distinction between these two sets of command uh, while the software commands facilitate data analysis on the other hand the answers that are sought by the analyst are closely related to the data that is being analyzed so out of these two sets of commands we would like to predict only the data commands um, and here is the uh, information about the data commands <clears throat> Since we are predicting only the data commands, uh, the ground truth for a sequence that is shown here is the next data command, which is shown in, uh, in bold format uh, that follows the sequence. So uh, let's have a look at uh, how we identify the goals. Uh, we leverage unsupervised approach from the prior art to solve this problem. We treat the sessions as the documents, uh, we treat the commands as the words and goals uh, as topics and apply topic modeling. Uh, we use bytom topic model because it is suitable for short text. In our case, uh, it's uh, sequences. Uh, for fixing the number of goals, we use the popular measures, uh, which are UCI and UMass. And uh, the object of both the measures is to is that the commands that belong to a particular goal should be close to each other, and the goals themselves should be far apart from each other. And for annotation, um, providing a human readable names, we use a human annotation method. Uh, now that we have identified the goals, let's see how do we incorporate this information into the models. Uh, the first approach we have tried is a simple ensemble approach. Uh, we assign each session to the top goal uh, that is identified by the Bytom topic model. And then we segregate the data into different sets based on these labels. We then learn one model per goal. Um, and the architecture is uh, shown here. Uh, we feed the commands to the LSTM model using learn embedding. Uh, we predict the next command in the sequence. And here, as we can see, it's uh, one model uh, per one goal. Uh, while this is an implicit input of goal information to the data, the models might lose generalizability because they haven't seen sessions outside the uh, goal. So we explicitly provide the goal information here. Uh, we do that through three methods. We, uh, uh, it's just like enumeration of different uh, ways of concatenating the goal information, uh, we embed that. And here uh, it is a single global model. Um, these are the baselines which do not have any goal information. And the next ones are the ensemble approaches. Uh, we just ensemble them, uh, the baselines using the ensemble approach. And these are the final results that we uh, get from the uh, um, uh, with goal information. And also, if we look goal-wise uh, results, uh, we see uh, that we have best performance across all the goals. Uh, we'll talk about the fine-tuned model shortly. So let's have a look at our uh, custom loss function. Uh, so far, all the proposed models use standard cross entropy loss. Uh, this loss makes sure that the recommendations are aligned with the input sequence. Uh, however, they do not consider that uh, the predicted command is relevant to the specified goal or task uh, or not. So uh, we introduce a component into the loss function which provides information about the goals. We already have the probability distribution of uh, observing data commands in a goal, uh, which is the output of the bytom topic model. And um, we need to measure the how much the predicted our uh, distribution of command deviates from this uh, goals distribution. So we use KL averages loss for that. And we finally use a weighted loss function. Um, coming to the fine tuning. So if we look at the component Q, uh, which is the goal command distribution, uh, it is different for different goals. So eventually we have to train our one model per goal uh, in order to um, uh, reach that distribution of Q. Uh, but to ensure generalizability, which was lost in ensemble method, we first pre-train the uh, model with all the data and then fine tune uh, with the modified loss function for each goal. Uh, using this, we get both accurate and goal relevant outputs and also inherent advantage will be, uh, we get good performances for low resource goals. So we have seen the test accuracy. Uh, we have a significant improvement with the goal informed models, uh, but the measure does not convey or uh, doesn't inform, uh, doesn't test whether the uh, recommendations are being goal-oriented or not. Therefore, we provo propose a new measure, uh, which we call as geo-measure. 
uh, the first term here is the accuracy and the second term is the probability that we obtain from the byton topic model and to ensure balance between both the uh, 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 results we use the uh, formula which is similar to urban score uh coming to evaluation uh, as expected the go1 value is higher for the models with goal information uh after fine tuning we see a sharp increase in the go1 measure uh, in, uh signifying the importance of the loss functions as well as the fine tuning approaches and the performance is consistent across all the goals uh so it is often possible that uh, in a real case scenario the user might deviate uh, from the specified goal so we would like to uh, test how our models would perform in such scenarios so for that we have simulated an experiment um, uh, we uh, uh, take a model uh, we uh, which is trained on one data distribution and uh, we test it from all the other points which are getting from different data distribution different goal distribution and as expected we see a decrease in the accuracy of models uh, the reason uh, is because of um, uh, the goal orientation component that is present in the loss uh, however the goal uh, the overall go measure is still intact which provides the evidence that uh, the recommended data commands are still relevant to the input goal and it is uh, consistent again uh, consistent the performance is consistent across the uh, different goals so uh, concluding uh, we summarize the uh, notion of a goal in data analytics software applications we have investigated the effectiveness of incorporating the goal information uh, while recommending the data commands and we designed the custom loss function and also experimented with fine tuning paradigm uh, we have uh, proposed a novel evaluation method which is the go1 measure in future we would like to explore the recent advances in att attention mechanism and transfer learning to further boost the performance also we would like to experiment more sophisticated models uh, uh, that can predict the user's goal instead of asking the user and we would also uh, handle the problem of novice user misspecifying the goal thereby providing better uh, recommendations uh, thank you and uh, we'd appreciate any questions thank you very much for your presentation um we have a we have a question i think from from mustafa kandavala um can you give some examples of goals in this problem yes um so the goals are uh, actually not visible because i uh, couldn't fit it in here but so they, those dependent uh, those are dependent upon the software that we are using so for our case uh, it's actually some things like uh, product uh, uh, planning uh, for market research and uh, uh, something like uh, device uh, so this is actually proprietary data so we will give a, I'll, i can give a, a over, overview of um, uh, the goals uh, that are possible like uh, for example uh, uh, when a particular uh, uh, user is trying to analyze what type of devices uh, are more um using a particular website that can be a goal uh, um yeah okay do we do we have further questions no okay I've, then let's thank our first speaker thank you for your presentation and uh let's move to the next presentation and the next presentation will be done by Li Wei Wu and this uh, paper has been nominated for the best paper award and it is called SSEPT sequential recommendation via personalized transformers and Li Wei Wu is from University of California in Davis Okay, thank you for the introduction. So yeah, my name uh, my name is Li Wei, and uh, uh, I was a PhD student at UC Davis. Uh, and this is joint work with my colleagues uh, Su Qing, uh, Chiao, and James. So the paper is called the uh, SSPT. Uh, uh, so it's a sequential recommendation for a personalized transformer. Uh, so what is the sequential recommendation problem? So sequential recommendation, uh, traditionally recommend system usually test ratings or rating pairs as input. 
and then time time, time component usually you just use as a feature. But in sequential recommendation, the item sequence uh, that, that the user engaged in this temporary ordering are actually given as input. So in this example, the user may have watched a series of movies and you want to predict for that particular user what movie uh, he want to watch next. So for this, uh, so, the, so if I put it in a mathematical format, then the problem setting is that if you are giving user i's input sequence is i from for i from one to n, and you know the sequence uh, the j i one to j i t, uh, so that the the second subscript i uh, one to t indicates the time a uh, time time step, and then the the goal is you want to predict the next item, giving the uh, giving the pre, uh, the user's previous engagement history. So if you think about this, this actually shares a lot of similarity uh, with the word sequence in NLP because each item can be thought of as a word in a sentence. And, uh, and that's, why, uh, uh, that's why people have uh, tried to use a uh, transform model and the bot model from NLP into this problem. So if you are familiar with transform model, it's basically a uh, self-attention uh, self-attention model, but uh, you stack, uh, stack the self-attention uh, module uh, multiple times. A uh, better model is an uh, improvement on the transform model by making the, uh, it bi-directional. So the first paper that adopts the transform model into this problem is the sas paper uh, in 2018. So this paper it directly used the transform model to this problem, but uh, the one thing, uh, the one thing I, I don't really like is that the, the, the paper uh, treats this problem as the same as NLP problem. So it doesn't consider the user, uh, the personalization component at all. But for recommend system, the most important part is probably the personalization. So traditionally, um, in, in metrification approach, usually this personalization uh, can, be, uh, can be addressed by using uh, user embedding. Uh, but in NLP models, uh, because user embeddings don't do not exist at all, so so it's very hard to incorporate them directly. So uh, similarly for the birth for red model, so birth for red model is also uh, similarly applying uh, birth model to this problem. This is the paper in two thousand nineteen. <clears throat> And the both paper didn't use the uh, user embedding at all. And the reason uh, the sense right papers argue that is because the transform model is expressing enough. So, so that uh, if you have a lot of data, then the user embeddings are not needed. Um, but that's the part I don't, I don't agree. So, so I want to argue that um, the reason we don't find the user embedding useful if you add them naively, it's because the uh, it's because actually because it's overfitting. So, for for currently the, the for the existing regularization techniques such as job out, weight decay, or permanent sharing, those those techniques are not sufficient enough uh, to reduce the overfitting issue. So I did a simple experiment before when I was starting the project. So if you don't use regularization, the NDCG and the recall is. Uh, it's just a bad. And then if you add the parameter sharing by, by using the same embedding for use for users with job or gender or age, those helps the results a little bit, but it's not as good as the SAS red paper. Um, but then if you add the L2 regularization or drop out, those can also get you a little better, but uh, those are also not enough to build the baseline SAS red paper. So it's very hard to add the embedding, use embedding, and then at the same time build the existing model without using embedding. So that's why we propose a new regularization method last year in the NeurIPS. Um, so it's called the uh, Swarkasted Hearing Embeddings. So th this, the, the main idea of this paper is that when you have embeddings, usually, currently people usually, usually in yeah, training time and deep and test time, you just uh, use a query, do a embedding look, table lookup, and then the embedding table lookup will give you exactly the same embedding you want. But uh, we find that that's not probably not the best way to do it. So in the training time, we modify the procedure a little bit. If you want to ask for, for example, for user ice embedding, 
instead of giving back the using as embedding directly, we actually have some probability that can give you a different embedding. But the different embedding, the I prime, uh, uh, supposedly should be related to I somehow. And then, and then if they are more related, then the probability of replacing I and I prime should be also be higher. And this way, uh, this now become a so shared here the embedding process because uh, now you don't actually get, always get the same embedding, but actually you will get different embeddings at different uh, iterations, training iterations. But then at the same, uh, but at the test time, we we always give you back the same embedding I. So the the benefits of doing this is actually this way actually uh, helps you to reduce all fitting, and we have uh, in the paper we we also provide some theoretical uh, guarantees. So it's actually smoothing the loss, uh, loss surface. And you can look up more detail in the paper. But the, the main idea is that with this uh, super constant here embedding regularization, we actually can kind of concatenate using embedding as input layer. And then when you do the, uh, when you do the dot product later, you also, con you also concatenate using embedding for the same user. So this way, uh, this way, uh, so the so the main difference between this and the previous subscribe is actually we add the using embedding at the at the bottom and also at the output. So we 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 explore the why this helps the result. So we look at one specific user's example in the movie lens one million data. So so this this is the sequence that a user watch in the in the history. So if you don't use the, our model, the separate model, the tension map, if we print out the tension map, the tension map will, will not be focusing on the recent items. Actually, it will be scattered all, uh, all over the sentence, uh, all over the sequence. So this is pretty much the similar to NLP uh, setting. So if you usually NLP attention will be scattered all over the se uh, sentences. But uh, if you, if you use the personalization, then actually the, there will be a lot of emphasis put on the recent items. And especially those items are also Shakespeare uh, dramas because the item you want to predict next is also Shakespeare drama. So that's why you can say the recent, uh, the recent uh, item like 41, uh, 31, 36, 33 have a lot of, uh, have a lot of attentions. But, uh, but in previous model, they, they are not able to capture that. So that's I think is uh, we are that's why we argue personalization actually is very useful, even though transform model is very powerful enough. Um, so we also did some quantitative results. So we compare with the existing uh, non deep learning method and deep learning method. For example, BPR is uh, here, uh, and there are also some like the uh, the Markov chain methods. And also recent, yeah, later in, I think it's starting from 2015, there are some GRU method and uh, um, and there's a, as this one is, oh, sorry, this one is the CNN method and uh, this one is transform, transform, uh, transform models. So we, we, we find that using the, our uh, model actually give you the best results in all of the uh, data, same data the that we are used. Uh, similarly, we also is uh, we also we, we actually did a very good uh, ablation study in our paper. So if you're interested in that, we can also look at details. But here, the main idea is we want to see how how to return the user embedding. And then here in this example, we find that the the best uh, best way uh, to do this uh, sorry best way to do this is use uh, use uh, use embedding fifty and item embedding hundred. So you don't have to use the same dimension at all. And uh, of course, the, the longer the sequence you use, the better results are. So that's why using 200 helps the results. Uh, I didn't mention this the SSPD++ in the, in the presentation, but uh, essentially it's, uh, we, we want to chop down the sequence if the sequence is too long. Uh, but I, I think that's the open-ended open problem because it's very hard to chop down the sequence while maintaining the, the, the good uh, performance. Uh, and also we we also show the training speed of our method, and uh, you can see that our adding the using embedding doesn't really have doesn't really hurt our convergence speed. So uh, we can still pretty much convert very fast for this uh, for this uh, 
movie lens one million data set. So I guess the main takeaway uh, for this uh, presentation is that uh, first we propose a novel uh, architecture called SSPT for this uh, particular security recommendation problem. Um, and uh, this, this model enjoys the benefits of being personalized model where I achieve, so achieving better re ranking results than the current state of art. Um, and we also demonstrate the importance of the SSSE regularization uh, the, for incorporating user embeddings. And we find that we, we, we feel that a similar technique should also be applied when you when you when people try to adapt the other NLP models to recommend system, just because our recommend system has some properties that NLP doesn't have, especially personalization. And our code are, are, are posted online on, on GitHub. So you can also have a look at our code. Um, yeah, that that's um, that's my presentation. So uh, any questions? Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, there are some questions. Uh, this one is by Jason Brancasio. How would you propose to store and update input sequences in real time uh, in a production deployment at scale? Oh, you mean is it because the user embeddings uh, probably are too many or? I think the difficulty could be that the user, embed user embedding, if there are too many users, then you, it's very hard to store every uh, user embedding. So I, so I think that the probably one common way is people usually hash them into a basket. Uh, so you, it, it's, it's okay you don't use the entire, like the, I don't know, um, a billion user as a user embedding, but you may want to still maintain like a, a certain basket and uh, you want to hash the user embedding into those baskets. So you can still have some personalization and you don't use too much memory. I guess that's a trade-off question. Yeah. Okay, great. And there's another question by Bob Felde. How sensitive is the stochastic embedding method to data set size? Uh, actually, in our Lourdes uh, 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 paper, we actually we actually did a bunch of experiments, not only in this current data uh, setting, but we also did an experiment on, uh, for, for example, immunization and also BPR and also also other NLP tasks. And actually, actually it's, it's not very it's not very sensitive to this uh, data set size at all. And uh, and as in the uh, I don't know. Later, we also there's also there's also a three PR paper this year use uh, uses this uh, regression technique. So so I think uh, I think it's not very sensitive to data set size. So if, even if you are using machine translation, that that could be a very large data set, but it's still works. Okay, and so there's another question by Zeman Park. Um, why do you think a user adding a user embedding leads uh, to having more attention on the most recent items? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't have a definite answer there, but uh, but I think my suspicion is that when you add user embedding, then, then the model may, be, may learn that the other users uh, may also may also put a lot of attention on recent items. So, so, so instead of uh, focusing on what items, uh, as NLP, like the NLP, because each word is uh, is equal weight, pretty much equal weighted, and uh, you don't you don't put more emphasis on recent ones. But if you if your model realize that other users are uh, pretty much also rely on the recent ones to predict, maybe the maybe the model can learn that from other users. So that's my my suspicion, but I'm not hundred percent sure. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, You're on mute. Zeno is on mute. Oops, excuse me. One, so we are pretty well on time, but uh, so one final question. And if more people have questions, feel free to use the system to ask further questions. So Norman asked, when T is high enough, can we feed the model with the full user's interaction sequence? already containing everything about their tastes. What extra information then is captured by the user embeddings? 
Yeah. So first, I want to uh, make it clear. So the teeth cannot be very large. So that's the main issue for the transform model or the birth model. Is that the way T is over 500, then it's very, very actually it's very hard to uh, optimize. Not un, not uh, not only to optimize, but also to uh, to make the information pass through the transform model entirely. So so that's why it's very hard to uh, to to deal with the long sec uh, long sequences. Uh, but uh, but I think that even even so, the user embedding is still useful because uh, because when you think about this, if you have two uh, I sequence, uh, I mean identical sequence, but if you're giving to for two di two different users, do you expect them to be the same for two different users? If they're not the same, then you should probably want to address the difference somehow, right? Because maybe one user uh, likes to watch cartoon more in the history, so 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 looking at maybe they have the same uh, watch history recently, but doesn't mean they. I mean, they are currently say identical. So I think uh, using embedding is basically address your uh, inherent interest, and uh, that can be different even giving the same user watch history. Okay, great. Thank you for the presentation and and the answering the audience questions. Thank you. Uh, okay, let me stop sharing the screen. Okay, so let's go to the next presenter and the next presentation. Um, it is a pleasure to introduce Sangamitra Depp from JAG Inc. And the topic of the talk is developing a recommendation system to provide a personal, personalized learning experience at JAG. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to my session. Uh, I'm very excited to talk at Rexis. Uh, and I will mainly be speaking about how we create personalized experiences at Check uh, for students to have an optimal learning uh, session. So a brief uh, outline uh, of the talk. Uh, I will talk about what we mean by recommendations at Check, and then how we organize our content into a knowledge graph, do a deep dive into content classifications, talk a little bit about cross-product recommendations and leave you with some takeaways. Uh, so at Check, when we do recommendations, the main goal is to show the most relevant content to students in a timely fashion. Uh, in order to do this, the main thing that fuels this process is organizing our content into a knowledge graph and then detecting patterns in student behavior uh, that helps us personalize um, the student experience. Well, let me go a little bit into what we do at Check. Uh, so Check is a learning platform. It's like a central hub where a student comes in and can get help in different parts of their learning uh, path. They could be students in their sophomore year, or they could be looking for jobs. Um, it it could be it could be anything that they're doing. So I wanted to give like an example of a particular uh, personalized experience at Check. Uh, this is one product which is called uh, Textbook Solutions, and students come in. Uh, and go through the solutions to learn more about uh, their study material. And for this particular student, we already know that the student is studying engineering mechanics based on their uh, past behavior. And we tell them based on your progress, you should be studying these chapters. We also know that the student may be studying chemistry. So we show some more questions in chemistry. So this is like a typical personalized experience at Czech. Um, and you get this kind of experience in textbook rentals, question answering, online tutoring, uh, flashcards, and so on. Uh, so this is a good point uh, to segue into the knowledge graph or how we organize our content. Uh, so the way we organize our content is we have this hierarchy of concepts. Uh, and it starts with like a subject level. And then within each subject, there are multiple courses like you know, biology 101, intermediate microbiology, and so on. And then there are concepts within a course, and then there are subconcepts within each concept. Um, this, uh, we do not learn the system. This is something we harvest from subject matter experts. Uh, and they're constantly looking at data and basically adding new nodes to the system as new uh, material becomes more relevant uh, to our product. Uh, one example of this knowledge graph is, uh, I'll take a particular subject physics, and you have courses like electricity and magnetism mechanics and quantum physics as courses. And then in mechanics, you could have topics like acceleration, displacement, velocity, projectile motion. Uh, now, the next part 
of the process is connecting the content to these, the nodes in the knowledge graph. And we do this by uh, using machine learning classifiers. And I will go uh, more into details about the classifiers in a few slides. Uh, but I also wanted to show you what the content looks like in each of our product. So in question answering, a typical uh, content would look like a question in physics with you know, talking about a moving bicycle. In flashcards, you have front of the ca card and back of the card. Very often, it could be a concept and a definition. In textbook rentals, here you see that you know this is the uh, in the if you go to the web page, you can go and rent this physics uh, textbook. And for writing tools, which is like help with writing, basically students upload paper and you can get your paper checked for grammar or for other aspects by an expert at the site. And you can also build recommendations. Uh, so this is like this is a step where we connect all our content to these different nodes in the knowledge graph. The next step is how do we connect users to the knowledge graph? Uh, so let's say we have user one who has studied this first question in um, question answer in the product, which, uh, which is question answering. And uh, they have also rented a book in physics. So from this activity, we know that, you know, this user one is uh, taking the course physics 101 and they are studying the topic acceleration at this point in time. And based on that, when they visit another product, we can uh, do different kinds of recommendations. And similarly for user two, um, you know, they may, might be interested in a different course and so on. Um, let me now go into like some more details of the machine learning classification pipeline. Uh, so this is the typical text classification pipeline. Uh, and I wanted to um, show like the entire process because each of these steps are really imp important to make sure that the final product that comes out is of higher quality. Uh, so text pre-processing is really important because it reduces noise uh, and um, you know, re reduces junk words and uh, other aspects. There is some kind of rule-based cleaning that also goes on in text pre-processing. The next phase of a classification pipeline is collecting training data. So in our case, we collect training data uh, through one mode, which is uh, getting um, annotations from subject matter experts. Uh, we also have other modes where the students actually tell us which course they belong to. Uh, and it's optional so that we, we don't necessarily have all of that data. It's important to make sure that the uh, training data collection pipeline is foolproof. And there is like several QA process that goes on in this, uh, in this pipeline, because this is what feeds the model. And the performance of the model is directly correlated to how good the training data is. And the next part is model building. And I'll go into more details in the model building in the next few slides. Uh, and then finally, model evaluation. Uh, depending on the product in which you know, this particular model is used, sometimes it is optimized for precision. And you, know, you could have like a very high precision, low coverage model in some cases. And in some other cases, recall might be more important. So you have full coverage. Uh, and high recall with maybe lower precision. And then finally, it's deployed online to see how students react to these things. Uh, so now I will go uh, deep into one classification pipeline. And um, this is like one product of flashcards. And decks are a group of cards that uh, students put together to um, basically help them with studying. And uh, the idea here is that one deck belongs to one course and maybe multiple topics, but typically one course. Um, and um, the reason why I chose this classification, the classification at this level of granularity, because we have several thousands of courses. So it makes like assigning courses to decks a little dif more difficult than subjects, uh, but we were still able to collect good amount of training data, both from subject matter experts and students to make the problem feasible. Uh, so I typically start a classification pipeline with uh, like a very simple classifier with TF-IDF features and you know, throw an SVM or a logistic regression uh, for, for the modeling. And the main reason I do it is because you can test small amounts of data. Like while your training data is coming in, you can test this pipeline and see you know, if you're getting some very like awkwardly wrong results and then you can go back and you clean the data. Uh, but as you know, as the quality of data increases and as requirements for deployment uh, are also specified, we see several cons in this method. One, it's not able to 
um, deal with multiple symbols or um, you know raw text very well in some cases. Uh, the other uh, problem is if you your model can become increasingly large because your token space can be very large if you're trying to include both characters and words to incorporate all possible variations in data. Uh, to, de uh, to deal with these issues, um, we turn to deep learning. And uh, the model we have used is character-based CNNs. And the nice thing is it's character-based, so it's able to deal with out-of-vocabulary words. It works for multiple languages because we have courses like intermediate Spanish or beginner's Italian. Um, and the model size is very small so in the since the maximum number of tokens are limited to like 70 characters. Um, and last but not the least, convolutions and pooling layers are really good for classification tasks where we expect uh, strong local clues regarding class membership. What this means is it's pretty good at picking up uh, engrams, so, uh, which are very often representative of a certain co course. Uh, so let me now go into the CNN architecture. Uh, so this is how like the architecture is played out. You have some kind of text, it's quantized, and then we have like two layers of convolution and pooling. And then after that, we have a dense layer, a dropout, a ReLU, and a, and a normalization layer. And this is like the basic architecture. We use this architecture and do multitask modeling. So uh, we have two tasks. Um, and the reason we do multitask is that there's this, uh, the front of the card and the back of the card, this correlation, we get it for free. So might as well use it to improve the uh, classification process. So task number one is to predict the back of the card given the front of the card. And task number two is a classification. And we do them together um, and it improves the accuracy overall. Um, so looking at model accuracy, um, Basically, this has 73% accuracy on offline test data. Uh, we are just uh, sending it out uh, online. Uh, some of the challenges of this problem is that we had uh, very imbalanced training data because a lot of the training data was fueled by what students were giving us. And some courses have very low traffic compared to other courses. So we have like very low training data in them. Um, so some of the solutions we are looking into is, of course, collect more training data get SMEs to tag more data in courses that we have lower data in. And the other is use some rule-based techniques to augment training data. Of course, rule-based based techniques have the issue of having biases, so we're also looking into that. Uh, finally, I would like to talk a little bit about cross-product recommendations. And I think I gave a glimpse of it when I said I was connecting users to uh, different nodes in the knowledge graph. Uh, so typically what happens is users would often use one product, such as check study, where they're you know, studying questions, and then browse through a few more products, but not really have that much activity. Uh, so, but because we know what courses they're taking or what content they have looked at in some products, we're able to deal with the cold start problem in other products by either surfacing the most popular trending content in the courses they're taking, or by using text-based similarity based on their content engagement on the other product. And we use a combination of both to surface content uh, at check. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I will leave you with these takeaways since I think I'm already over time. Thank you for staying in time. Uh, no worries though. Um, I have, I have a, I have two questions for you. Um, one is whether you considered other kinds of neural architectures beside, besides convolutional networks, for instance, uh, recurrent networks or, or maybe uh, attention-based, transformer-based approaches? Uh, so we did look at transformation-based, uh, sorry, transformer-based uh, approaches a little bit. It didn't necessarily give us better results. Uh, and this could be driven by like the quality of our training data and other aspects of it. We haven't looked at RNNs for this. One of the main uh, advantages of the model that we have right now is it's extremely lightweight. So the API in which it's deployed works very fast, which was one of the product requirements that we had. Okay, very good. Um, speaking of lightweight, did you also consider like uh, non-neural approaches, uh, things like like linear models or, or gradient boosted decision trees, or as we are here at, at, at Rexis, um, maybe 
classic approaches like like KNN? Uh, so KNN is more of a clustering approach, I think. Uh, I have considered like the simple uh, TFIDF based features and other kinds of features and then done things like logistic regression on top of it. Uh, those models were lower both in performance and the models were heavier. Okay, great. So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, the next presentation is from, from Amazon Search, Search. The presenter is Lakshmi uh, Ramakandran. I hope I pronounced your <laughs> name uh, at least somewhat approximately uh, correct. <laughs> um, the, oh, no, no worries. No, no worries at all. It's all good. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, the topic of your talk is uh, behavior-based popularity Oops. ranking on Amazon Video. Cool. Uh, thank you, Zeno. Um, so hi, uh, my name is Lakshmi. Um, I'm an applied scientist at Amazon Search. And um, today I'll be talking about my work on developing uh, behavior-based uh, popularity models to rank videos on Amazon. Um, so when customers use um, video streaming services, they use predominantly two approaches to find content. One is through the discovery mode, uh, which is when you're on your landing page, you know, you see these carousels of videos that you can sort of scroll through, uh, page through the carousels and find a video, a movie or a show that you're interested in watching. And the other mode is through search where, you know, you click in the search box and you type in the name of the movie or the show that you're interested in, and then pick from the search results what, um, you know, what video you're interested in streaming. Um, discovery on Amazon video actually accounts for a large uh, fraction of the traffic. It's, it, it accounts for over 70% of the traffic. So it's a pretty sort of big part of Amazon video. So there's a lot of sort of focus on uh, improving the customer experience in this space. Now in the discovery mode, um, sort of unlike in the keyword search mode, um, customers don't uh, uh, specify an, an, an explicit sort of intent, right? So in the, in the keyword search mode, you know exactly what movie or show they're searching for most often. Um, but in the discovery mode, you don't uh, kind of have that context. Um, in addition to that, there's also challenges that are posed by um, the scale. You know, Amazon video is huge. Um, there's a lot of uh, different types of content. So you have movies, TV shows, um, live sports, channel subscriptions. Um, so identifying a model that can actually um, work effectively across these different sort of use cases is, is a challenge. Um, apart from that, um, you know, surfacing new and uh, trending or original content is also a huge challenge um, because there's not a lot of um, engagement data associated with new uh, new videos. So this is the you know classic cold start problem, which happens to be a pretty big challenge for um, a discovery in Amazon Video. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to sort of like focus on um, predicting um, the popularity of videos. Um, so historically, um, heuristics have been applied um, to identify whether a video was popular or not. So examples could be, you know, the number of clicks that a video has um, received, the number of times a video was streamed, for instance. So these kind of serve as uh, reasonable indicators of um, a video's popularity. Though they may be effective on small data sets, they often don't scale. And uh, as you can imagine, it worsens the cold start problem, right? Because there's new videos that keep coming into the service. They don't really have a lot of, um, uh, you know, click or stream information. So that can sort of uh, disadvantage these new videos compared to the, the ones that have existed in the system for a while. So in this work, we're sort of focusing um, on using um, aggregate or cumulative um, streaming behavior as a, as, a, as a strong indicator of popularity, which is why it's sort of behavior based. So we take information from across um, you know, millions of customers and, and identify things like how many times this video was streamed, how many customers streamed it, um, what, uh, what were the total number of minutes this video was watched for. So indicators of that sort um, identify uh, are better sort of um, um, uh, suggestors of the popularity of a video. So we're basically using um, the expected number of streams that a video is likely to generate as a proxy for popularity. Um, and this is computed as a product of, you know, the predicted popular uh, probability that a video would get streamed 
and the expected number of streams that it would generate conditioned on the fact that it would get streamed. So when we train our models, we typically use um, uh, three types of features. Um, so this could in include um, aggregate customer streaming and purchase signals. So the ones I described like, you know, the total number of minutes watched, number of days, number of customers. So there's a lot of engagement uh, data associated with it, not just in terms of streaming, but also in terms of purchases, because you want to account for the different use cases or the different types of content that's available to stream on um, Amazon Video. Apart from that, we also factor in video metadata. So things like runtime, price of the video and so on. Um, and there's also date-based features. Now date features actually play a pretty important role because they give you a sense of how uh, old a video is in the service and it helps sort of like capture um, video newness. So we trained three ensemble models to predict a smooth uh, probability of stream as well as the expected number of streams. Now there does exist um, a lot of work uh, showing the effectiveness of you know, deep learning models in the recommender system space. Um, so, uh, but you know, deep learning models are known to sort of add uh, a lot of, um, tend to be more complex and add um, to the latencies of uh, production systems, sometimes beyond acceptable thresholds. So we are weighing um, you know, the uh, complexity of the model that we want to deploy versus the effectiveness of these models. And we found that tree ensemble models, while being less complex, were actually pretty effective for the task at hand. So we chose tree ensemble models to sort of um, uh, solve our problem in this case. Um, and the way we train our models is we use uh, non-overlapping time windows. And what this means is the training validation test sets are collected from different periods. So training is from a period in the past and validation and tests are from future periods. So the idea here is to be able to um, build models that can uh, generalize sufficiently to new videos. And um, this would be because, you know, in the case of, for instance, Prime Video, you have a lot of new videos that keep getting added to the service every, every so often, every other week or, you know, in the month. So you have these models that have been trained on data um, that, you know, that are uh, completely sort of blind to these new videos that were released. So this is a good way to sort of um, evaluate the ability of the model to generalize. Um, and then another thing I'd like to call out was the impact of age as a feature. Um, as I previously mentioned, you know, surfacing new and original content has always been a, a huge challenge, especially when you have, you can deal with like new uh, shows that are added to Prime or like live sports. Um, but we found that um, age-based features um, help boost new content. So in the chart on the right, you can see that along the x-axis, we have you know, um, the age of the title in days, and along the y-axis, it's the score, the predicted score associated with this feature, right? And you could see that there is a small boost that's applied in the first few days of the title's um, age. So when it's newly released, there's not a lot of engagement data to go by. So you know, there's an organic boost that uh, this feature provides to those types of videos. Um, and then that falls after a, a short while, uh, making sure that by then, if the video has accrued sufficient engagement data, then that's what the popularity model should sort of rely on as opposed to um, this boost that it's receiving from this particular feature. So to summarize, um, overall, the model helped increase the number of streams. It helped increase the number of impressions as well as streaming of new videos that were released within the last two weeks. Um, and you have the screenshots between control and treatment. Uh, and treatment shows some of the newer movies that were boosted, it was new at the time. Um, and uh, yeah, um, the one thing that we noticed was when we trained these models uh, optimized for streams, they were actually hurting the discoverability of um, what are called purchasable videos, which is the rent or buy option that's available on um, you know, Prime Video. Um, and historically, the view has been that, you know, we, we create this one generic model that can basically encompass all uh, use cases. But we've seen that that doesn't really work, right? Because customer uh, engagement pattern is actually different for different video types. And po what popularity in fact means may vary based on video content type. So for the next round of evaluation, we actually trained a specialized model um, focused on um, uh, the purchasable content um, that's available on the service. 
the goal was basically to promote um, better quality purchasable videos, which was not sort of being uh, uh, done by the, the previous model that we, we deployed. Um, and, and we found that having this kind of sort of uh, uh, alternate optimization strategies focused on specific use cases resulted in a net positive impact in sales, of course, because this was sort of focused towards the rent or buy um, videos. But at the same time, it wasn't hurting the overall streaming uh, performance of these videos. So to conclude, um, you know, introduced some sort of scalable solutions to predict popularity of videos. Um, also. Uh, discussed sort of alternate or the use of alternate optimization strategies, particularly when necessary, because sometimes having different models um, uh, sort of targeted towards the same end can uh, make maintenance a hell, especially in, in, in complex production systems, you know, like your search engines. Um, so we want to ensure that we only deploy these kinds of options um, or alternate uh, strategies when necessary, when we see that the existing solution is negatively impacting customer experience. Um, and the one thing that we found um, lacking in the in the current experience was that, um, you know, we weren't factoring customers past actions, um, like searches, clicks, um, while we were um, making sort of popularity recommendations. Um, I, I, popularity still, we still want to maintain that what we recommend to customers are popular videos, but at the same time, we want to ensure that the popular uh, popular videos that are recommended um, are relevant within the current sort of streaming um, context of the customer. So if you're currently interested in watching, um, you know, period dramas, then if those, uh, if there are, if we have relevant recommendations among the popular uh, videos we've identified, then surfacing that higher. So making it while being popular, relevant to your search um, uh, or your streaming session. Um, I'd like to thank my colleagues at Amazon Search and Prime Video for their support and, uh, and feedback. Um, and thank you for the questions. Thanks. Thank you very much here in Berlin. It's getting dark, as you may see. Um, there are some questions from the audience. Absolutely. One second. One second, please. I need to get them up here. So Bob is asking, how do you identify discovery behavior versus navigational behavior? Um, the way we, uh, so, so they, they, they it depends on how they are logged. That would be the simple answer. So we log uh, discovery uh, in, in a slightly different way than we log navigation. So if you're, for instance, on the Amazon retail website, right? So there's a way to actually navigate into Prime Video through the retail website. So the logs basically tell you how you got there. Um, and, and so you uh, we make the distinction between explicit sort of search-based, um, you know, uh, impression of, of videos versus you know the, the organic sort of like if you're on the landing page and then discovering content that was impressed uh, on the landing page for instance i'm not sure if that answers your question but um, yeah. so you, you you differentiate uh not really the customer intent but like that that is a distinction on how the customer reaches that part of the website where you do the your recommendations how they arrive there Right. So for, for our purposes to identify, um, so, so discovery could include navigation. Like I said, if you were on the retail page, <clears throat> excuse me, and you um, clicked on Prime Video, right? And then you directly entered the landing page of primevideo.com, um, depending on where, where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, that would count as discovery in some sense, unless you've searched for something and then you, you know, you search for Prime Video and you got there. So I guess the the stream of actions kind of indicate whether you were navigating there or whether you, you know, landed there in the, in the discovery mode, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, okay. Um, Vincent asked, asked whether you introduce randomness in recommendations to avoid always recommending just the most popular elements. That's a great question. That's a great question. Actually, we, we don't do that. Uh, we it's 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 mostly because the me the messaging on on the on on the domain is basically that we are showing you popular videos. So it tends to be, um, it, it tends to abide by that sort of messaging, which is that if we're saying that we're showing you popular videos, we these are popular on the on the service across a large uh, swath of customers. Mm -hmm. um, but that would be an interesting experiment to try out because I think that can introduce things like diversity into the into the results because popularity by definition goes with the majority. 
Um, and sometimes that may not always be the best experience. So I, uh, I guess it, it might be an interesting experiment to try out in terms of like introducing diversity into, into, the, into the mix. Mm -hmm. So, so early in the presentation, you mentioned that heuristics are bad or are worsening the cold start problem. Right. Um, and Megan likes to know, like, in which way do they worsen the cold start problem? Right. So, so I guess what I, uh, I was getting at there was um, heuristics tend to be sort of, you know, manually curated. They're, they're rather simplistic because you're, you're focusing on a couple of metrics or a few different metrics as indicators of popularity. And uh, what ends up happening there is they often tend to be um, relying on historic data. So when you're relying on historic information, new videos, uh, they don't have that information associated with that. So there may be techniques to bootstrap that. You know, you could use things like transfer learning um, by looking at similarities between videos. So there are, there are ways, I mean, there exists a lot of work that suggests how you can um, handle that scenario. Um, but yeah, but but uh, I guess the point was relying entirely on historic information can sort of like disadvantage some of these newer videos which don't really have that information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the final question by Manish: How does the data imbalance towards popular titles affect the importance of the age feature? Do you perform some sampling while collecting training data, or do you use it as is? We we do we do sample because there's there's a really uh, because you're, you're dealing with 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 really large uh, data sets uh, large uh, amounts of data here, um, but the question so can can you say the question again like how does the data sample affect the age what, what was that exactly so how 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 does the data imbalance mm. and I guess that means does it mean bias I'm not sure towards popular titles affect the the importance of the age feature. So is there an interaction between popularity and and age? Yeah, I, I think I think that's that's a good point. I mean there there from from what we've seen, age tends to be a pretty good indicator. Uh, surprisingly of at least in the in the models that I've I've built, it's this it seems to be a good indicator. Uh, but you're right, having the right sample is key here. Sometimes you know the new videos may get sort of lost in the mix, especially um, if they're dominated by videos that have been around for a while, um, you know, episodes of shows uh, that have been around for a while. So um, I think that may affect um, the performance, but I've seen that age tends to be a pretty important indicator of, um, at least with the initial boost that you see um, for pop uh, of popularity, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for your presentation. Cool. Thank you. And let's move to the last presentation in this session. I want to introduce uh, Zachary Schendel from uh, the product innovation team at Netflix. And uh, his presentation will be a human perspective on algorithmic similarity. Hi everyone, my name is Zach Schendel. I'm the director of UX research at Netflix. And I'm gonna be talking about a human perspective on algorithmic similarity. And I did this project in partnership with Faraz Farzan and Siddhi Sundar, also part of the Netflix Product Innovation Consumer Insights team. Okay, so uh, a little story about myself to start. Um, even though this particular movie was recommended by a Netflix algorithm to me for, for a long period of time, I rejected it multiple times. Um, it just didn't really look that great or sound good from the description or from watching the trailer. Oftentimes, if I want to find more information about a movie, I will click into a section called More Like This, and it, it, it gives recommendations that are supposed to be similar to the source title in order to help you understand why something that looks unfamiliar could be similar to something that you've liked. I've seen a few of these movies before. They were, they were decent, but I wasn't really clear what the connection was between the recommendations and the source title. Eventually I did end up watching it, but it was mostly driven by stuff that I did off of Netflix. So I read articles about it online, I saw it recommended and I read some information about it. And, and then I realized that it was connected to things that I actually did enjoy. Um, and so I came up with my own 
personal list of more like this and what I would include to describe this title. And, and that is listed at the bottom of the screen. You have a couple titles, Blue Room and Green Room, who have some talent overlap. You have some uh, uh, genre themes from like Reservoir Dogs or Fargo or whatever, and then some actor, actress similarities from some of the others on the screen. If someone had recommended that movie to me with those recommendations, I would have watched it right off the bat for sure. And I wasn't the only one who had this challenge. Here's an example of a tweet that I found. Um, the row in my Netflix labeled because you watched Russian Doll covers so many genres that I think the algorithm said, hey, we noticed you watched an audiovisual entertainment. Do you know these are other audiovisual entertainments? And so what I wanted to understand with the through uh, user research was to find out how widespread this was and to find out how similar two titles actually need to be in order to be perceived by people as actually being similar enough to be put together. And so we asked Netflix members. We employed three different research methods. The first was an international landscape assessment of how similarity was used inside of similar categories like other video streaming services and outside of the category in e-commerce, as well as in physical stores, even just going to a target and looking at the end cap. The second thing we did was we did qualitative interviews with Netflix members, and we just scrolled through their Netflix account and looked at the different places where we use similarity algorithms and got an assessment from them on how well we were doing. And the last thing we'll do, we did, we'll talk about more later in the presentation, was to use inverse multidimensional scaling to understand the quantitative similarity between a source title and multiple other titles. Okay, so the answer overall is it's really complicated, but we found that we could help our recommendations and the, the complexity comes from three sources. It comes from the placement, so where the recommendations are placed, the second is the person who you're actually recommending them and what their past experiences with the title. And the third is the context. So what is going on around that recommendation? And essentially, if there is a similar algorithm, we found that you, you can't just take the same similar algorithm and put it all over the UI for every context and for every person. It just doesn't work as effectively. So let's talk about each of these. We'll start with the placement. So where in the user interface is the recommendation appearing. So th there's actually a lot of places in the Netflix UI that are populated by algorithms that use some kind of similarity to determine the recommendation. There is a section more like this, which I talked about earlier. There are rows like because you watched whatever title, after you finish a show, we, we will recommend something uh, afterwards that's related to it in some kind of way. But what we found when we did a bunch of research was that members had higher expectations of how similar something needed to be in order to be reasonable when there were one-to-one -one recommendations compared to when there were one-to-many recommendations. So you see the example on the left, once someone finishes watching a movie called The Kissing Booth, they are then recommended to all the boys I've loved before these, this rec recommendation makes complete sense. They're both teen romantic dramas with female leads. But then on the right, you see you should watch The Office US because of your interest in The Crown. That makes pretty much no sense at all. Uh, in what, but in both cases, you're, it's a risky recommendation because there is no backup. If that one title doesn't explain the source title, then it makes no sense. The, the opposite is true for one-to-many recommendations. Uh, you see these mostly while you're browsing. You have uh, these rows like because you watched whatever. So let's pretend for a second that this row was a one-to-one -one recommendation. Because you watched Million Dollar Beach House, you should watch Queer Eye. Those are completely different shows. The only thing that they have in common is that they are reality shows and Let's think of this now as a suite of recommendations. Because you watch Million Dollar Beach House, here's a bunch of other shows. And when you look at those bunch of other shows, you notice that this broad placement is mostly made up of other reality shows and it starts to make sense why those recommendations appear. So you can see that the, the expectations of a one-to-many recommendation are somewhat lower from people. 
And there are also higher expectations when the recommendations result from some kind of in explicit input from a member. So let's say they search for Stranger Things. We do have Stranger Things on Netflix, so you would expect to see Stranger Things. But if you've already watched Stranger Things and you're looking for something like Stranger Things, you would want to see things that are very similar. So Beyond Stranger Things would be a great example of something that's very similar to Stranger Things because it's like an after show. Some of these other ones are sort of similar, sort of not similar. And then also the more like this section, which I explained earlier, you actually have to go to a title and click more like this. So there's multiple steps that a user has to take in order to get that information. The more work you're doing to find out information about this title, the more input you have to give, the higher your expectations are of what of the similarity for the titles that are then recommended. So to summarize, there's really no one size fits all approach to employing similarity signals in algorithms. Places that display one-to-one -one recommendations have much higher user expectation of similarity than those with one-to-many recommendation. Okay, the second thing we're talking about is the person. So who is actually seeing the recommendation and what is their personal past experience with the source title? So we use this method called inverse multidimensional scaling. You can see in the middle of the screen that there's a, a recommendation and then we've given people a computer interface to drag other titles into wherever they feel like putting them. Uh, and then we can measure the distance between the source title and the other recommendations on the screen and look at how they cluster. And then we can ask people to do things like this, like enter a, a one or two word phrase that tells, tells us how you're going about clustering each of these things. After uh, like hundreds of participants, we can do a backend analysis to understand the, the, the similarity between any title and any other set of titles. So let's walk through one example to illustrate what we learned. So I, I mentioned Stranger Things earlier. It's a fairly multidimensional uh, title. You have different genres like sci-fi, fantasy, et cetera. It stars teens. It's nostalgic, set in the 80s. It, there's a couple famous people like Winona Ryder that's in it. Um, and then there's some tones like dark, scary, coming of age, et cetera. These movies right here, in case you haven't seen them, are very similar to Stranger Things. Um, they are mostly set in the 80s. Uh, they mostly have some sort of supernatural aspect. They're mostly related to groups of people that are doing something and there's comedic elements in, in almost all of them. The, the problem with recommendations like these is that you quickly run out of really good, perfectly similar titles. Uh, and these, but, but these kinds of recommendations would work better to to go back to what we were discussing earlier in one-to-one -one placements. In order to fill out the, the bulk of placements, you need to think about broad similarity and specific similarity. So let's talk about each. Broad similarity drivers, they're very surface level, things like genre and things like, oh, it is another sci-fi or it's another thriller. That'll kind of pique your interest. But if, you, if someone tells you, you should watch this because it is a drama, that doesn't really give you a whole ton of information. It just kind of tells you the genre. That's like the entry level, right? Then there are specific similarity drivers. And these were very, all they're, they're all over the place and super difficult to predict, but they were much more salient in terms of final points of proof to convince someone to try something out that they've never heard of before. So if I happen to be a really big Winona Ryder fan, you might recommend other movies starring Winona Ryder, even if they aren't related at all to Stranger Things. But other people might be latching on to different aspects of the movie, perhaps the teen aspect or the nostalgic aspect or the fact that they're battling monsters in the movie. So you can pivot off of any of these sort of things as specific similarity drivers. It's just much more difficult to do. Yeah, so as I said, th these are high risk, high reward pivots. Th this is where you get the most trust busters, which is essentially a, 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 what, we, what we call a recommendation that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And it makes people think we don't know what we're doing, where the link between the source title and the recommendation is unclear. So what we found about the person is that the degree to which something is or is not similar matters in the eye of the beholder. And you have to think about 
broad similarity like genre and specific drivers of similarity, things like actors and tones and setting and, and, and subplots and things along those lines. And if you can find some way of personalizing both those sets of drivers, you'll do much better in creating these sets of recommendations. Last, we'll talk about the context. So I mentioned earlier, after you finish a, mov uh, a movie or a show, Netflix will recommend something. Here's an example of something that's, that's mostly successful. After you finish Queer Eye, which is a reality show, you get another reality show, Next in Fashion, which is more of a competition reality show. But there's a lot of similarities between these shows. Unfortunately, what we found is while that is certainly a common path, you finish a reality show, you get another reality show and watch it, it is not... The, it is not the most common or only path people take after finishing a particular show. In fact, only 18% of the time that people finish a reality show, they watch a subsequent reality show. And only half of the time they continue in the general genre of unserialized content. And only half the time do they stick with Netflix originals. The other half of the time they go and watch licensed titles. So what we found is there just are a ton of member contexts in which similarity is unnecessary. And in fact, it can be the opposite of what people are looking for. For example, you finish a show and you decide you wanna rewatch something familiar or it was really intense and then you wanna change the pace, you wanna watch something lighter or you don't have time for another long movie, maybe you wanna watch something shorter. So to summarize, even if you hold all the other stuff constant, which we talked about earlier, if you don't understand the context or the type of person and what they typically do after finishing something or the kinds of stuff that they like to pivot off in terms of similar recommendations, your recommendations do have a high chance of failure. And so in the end, after doing all this research, there were some tweaks to the similarity model. And we found by putting the recommendations in front of people and testing them in the real world, that there were fewer perceived trust busters in our recommendations with the new model. And we were able to increase engagement with these kinds of collections. And so for me, at least, these are better recommendations in the more like this related to this title than I started with at the beginning of the presentation. And that is it. And I will open it up to questions. Thank you very much, Zach, for this uh, very interesting and, and relevant talk. Uh, I particularly liked uh, the terms that you used here, uh, trust busters and similarity drivers. I think they're really uh, catchy. Um, there is a bunch of questions. Uh, let me get to them. Um, so uh, how do you quantify you uh, the expectations of like the, the high or low expectations of users do you have a, a like a, a grasp on that yeah so i we don't i don't think we necessarily input that into a model per se but i think that what we think about is the is the canvas so once we know that there's a canvas that has higher expectations of similarity, like a one-to-one -one recommendation, then we might think about creating a different model for that canvas versus, uh, a, a, or we might incorporate different signals, or we might look at what happens specifically in that canvas in order to recommend stuff that also would appear in that canvas. So instead of having, you know, anywhere on any page, if a user watches this, then the next thing they're interested in this, one thing you think you might think about is not anywhere on any page, but in that specific canvas, when they watch this, then the next thing they watch is this. Okay. Um, there's a question coming from Andrea. Have you considered, this may be more like a feature request, have you considered a section, I'm bored of the same stuff I've been watching and I'm in a mood for something different because I'm stuck in my house? So yeah. For the, like a discovery later thing? That's funny. I guess you call that like kind of a may, could be a filter bubble. It could be that you feel like the recommendations are stale, something along those lines. Uh, we, we have had some conversations around how to keep the recommendations dynamic. Uh, but of course, coming from the psychological perspective, there's a lot of benefit to repeated exposure. And so you do have to have a balance between the two. 
if I show you a picture even implicitly multiple times, that picture will be more attractive to you than if I show it to you only one single time. So you have to, and, and of course, like there is also this trust component that goes into it. So if you've never heard of something and Netflix is recommending it to you, you need to like, over time you get used to it. Maybe you watch a little bit here, you talk to your friends about it, you read about it online a little bit, you start to see some like, uh, press about it or somebody tweets about it and you you gather these bits of evidence that push you like towards interest on the title or away from interest in the title and you have to allow time for that to happen good so bob has another question um how do you feel how do you deal with saturation so if, uh, for example if things are really similar um maybe a customer just watches the best one and, and skips the other Yeah, so that, that's a good question. One of the challenges is that people will have seen some of the things that we recommend in other places. So it could be on Amazon or live TV or whatever it is, if it's a licensed title. Um, an, a, another thing that we, that we think about is, um, this is a really difficult question. Sa would you call saturation like after, at, at a certain point, It, the recommendation doesn't actually help anymore and that we should stop recommending it because the person's not going to be interested in it. Is that how you would define it? From, from, the, from the way the question is posed, I would assume like, let's say there's five thrillers and after, after one thriller, I'm, I'm, I had, I've had enough of the, the, the topic or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So one thing that we've explored is the thing called the, uh, uh, it's called a show hole. You can look it up on the internet. It's in the, the Urban Dictionary. It's you've watched all of a series and at the end of the series, it's kind of like breaking up of a romantic relationship. You're kind of lost and you don't really know where to go next and you, and you feel a sense of loss uh, for the show that you've just finished and all the characters you've connected with. At that moment is when people tend to branch out in multiple different ways. They can kind of stick with that same theme. They can kind of take a break and go back to something familiar. Let's say they want to rewatch like The Office or Parks and Rec or Friends or something for a few days before they get back into something. Or they might do a complete spin-off and just go like from that thriller to a comedy or something as the, you could call that like a palate cleanser, if you will, like if you're into like wine tasting or something along those lines. It's something that we think about. It's something that we haven't actually perfected yet in our algorithms. Yeah, so <laughs> that's that's There's a question by Max. Uh, how do you how do you identify trust busters? Or and I would add to that maybe are there do you have examples for for like trust busters like like nice failures or something like that? Yeah, I mean I I presented one earlier where it's like because because you are interested in the crown you should watch uh, the Office. I mean there's almost no similarity between those titles. There's a whole host of those that people have posted on Twitter or something that you can go and look up that some of them are, are funny, some of them are not so funny, but we've, we've been doing our best to add a little bit of um, like, uh, you know, a bit of a human touch to, to some of those things. We've removed some pieces of evidence that repeatedly haven't been super helpful to people. Um, and when it comes, and we've done projects like this where I, I only showed you one result of one title stranger things but we've done this exact same paradigm where you ask people how similar pairs of titles are over and over again for hundreds of titles in multiple countries around the world and you can use that to then take that human data and then input that into algorithms to to get a sense of how trust bustery something might be another thing we've seen is that there are certain tags associated with titles That, are, that increase the likelihood of, of it being labeled a trust buster. And those are often hot button issues, things like politics and religion and things along those mm -hmm. lines. So you have to be particularly careful in those titles. So you have kind of like, um, you, you, you attach kind of warning signs to those so, so that, that they will not get out so easily or? Not necessarily warning signs, but you, but you should really think hard about like if this is like some sort of political show you should really think or religious related show you should really think hard about the things that are going to be recommended that are like it because it can quickly uh, spin into potentially offensive uh, places so and we care a lot about that um, so we, we put a lot of work into that in our search algorithms as well okay 
Great. Thank you for your presentation. Then this concludes the first um, paper session uh, of this year's Rexis. Uh, thank you to all the presenters for, for staying in time and for patiently answering all the questions that were coming from the audience. Of course, uh, thank you also to the audience. There were no major technical issues, which is great. I'm very happy about that. Uh, and kudos to the tech team and the volunteers and everybody in the background for making this possible and, and running this as, uh, as smoothly. And uh, so let's uh, thank our speakers again. And thank you all for in the audience for joining us in this session. And the next session is in one hour. And in the meantime, you can join the um, social activity, if you like, the, the, the next slot is called Rexis Newbies Meet Rexis Oldies, and it's a social event. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Robin, for being my stand-in in case something would have failed. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.